You're listening to the Assembly Call IU podcast and postgame show, the place where Indiana fans across the globe hang out online after every IU basketball game. Join us for our live broadcasts on Thursday nights and immediately following every IU game at our website, assemblycall.com. That's assemblycall.com. Before we get to this week's episode of Assembly Call Radio, let's talk for a moment about tickets. Because for a sports fan, there really is nothing quite like being there in person. Just ask anybody who went to the Indiana-Virginia football game <laughs> last weekend. You know, yes, the weather was terrible. It was awful. But think about the memories that were created. And plus, Indiana won. And being there in person, there's nothing quite like that. The people who were there, who saw it in person, are going to remember that game much more than the people who stayed home and watched it on TV. The thing is, getting tickets online can be complicated. There are tons of sites. They vary in reliability. It's hard to know who to trust. And that's why I recommend SeatGeek. It's the ticket site that I use. I have their app on my phone. And so when I want to see a Mavericks game here in Dallas or go to a baseball game or get concert tickets for me and my wife, I go to SeatGeek because you can trust them. They fully guarantee all of their purchases. Uh, and it's designed to make the ticket buying experience easier than ever because they search multiple ticket sites, grade the tickets based on value. So they help you immediately identify the best seats to fit your budget. And here's the best part. Since you're a listener to the assembly call, you actually get $20 off of your first SeatGeek purchase. So all you have to do is download the SeatGeek app, enter the promo code assembly, A-S-S-E-M-B-L-Y today. That's promo code assembly. And you will get $20 off your first SeatGeek purchase, whether it's for IU football tickets, for IU basketball tickets coming up, or any other sporting event, concert, anything. You SeatGeek, life's an event, we have the tickets. Welcome, Hoosier fans, to this week's edition of Assembly Call Radio, where each week we discuss the most important IU basketball stories from the past seven days. This is our 93rd edition of Assembly Call Radio, and it is our 424th episode overall of the Assembly Call, recorded on the evening of Thursday, September 13th, 2018. I am your host, Jared Morris. And let's begin this edition of the Assembly Call how we begin every edition of the Assembly Call, and that is with our Hoosier Proud Banner Moment. And Indiana is the national champion. When it comes down, Indiana will be champion. Martin takes the shot. Oh, the Hoosiers have won the national This week's Banner Moment occurred on Wednesday afternoon when former Hoosier great Alan Henderson sent out a tweet congratulating his college roommate Brian Evans on being chosen for the Indiana Athletics Hall of Fame. First of all, I hope it never stops being a thrill when I see a tweet from one of my childhood heroes pop up in my Twitter feed. Second of all, seeing Alan's tweet reminded me of the incredible chemistry and basketball IQ that the 1992-93 IU team had, due in part to how the roster was constructed, which was, to use an Archie Miller term, very inside out. Every single member of that Indiana team, save for one bench player, was from the Indiana-Ohio-Illinois breadbasket. Heck, every regular except for Chris Reynolds was actually from Indiana. And that's typically how it goes for great Indiana teams, which obviously have been few and far between of late. But look back, and almost all highly successful IU teams featured at least half of the regulars from that breadbasket, usually more. Now contrast that with Indiana teams of recent vintage. Last year's team had just three guys from Indiana, Ohio, and Illinois. Tom Crean's final team had the same, just three guys from the breadbasket. But we're already seeing that change under Archie. This year's team will have five guys who project as regulars from the breadbasket. Romeo, Robert Finnessy, Zach McRoberts, Jerome Hunter, and Justin Smith. And next year's team will likely have at least five guys and possibly more if in-state recruits like Trace Jackson Davis and Keon Brooks choose IU. Bottom line, yes, IU fans can sometimes go a bit overboard in describing the importance of locking down the borders. 
But the evidence suggests that the surest path to consistent success for IU is building a roster foundation around players from Indiana, Ohio, and Illinois, and then smartly filling in around them with talented players from outside the region who fit the culture, your Victor Oladipos and Juwan Morgans. That's what Archie promised to do the day he was hired, and so far, it's exactly what he's doing. He knows it's his best chance to put together rosters that rival the great ones that Alan and Brian played on together. Okay, now let me introduce my esteemed co-host for this week's show. To my left, he is the Todd Yegley of Girls Youth Sports Coaching in Cincinnati. He is the president emeritus of the Robert Johnson Fan Club, and he is renowned the world over for his bracketology expertise. He is the fun-loving Andy Bottoms. This is fun. This kind of game is fun. This was fun. All right, well, this was fun. Andy, what is your bottoms line for the last week in IU basketball? Well, it's been a fun week, Jared. Let me tell you. Um, no. <laughs> well, I think at this point, um, I'm just trying to soak up any college basketball preview related content. I bought my third preview magazine today, which uh, is, you know, and I still have blue ribbon order that will uh, will be coming at some point. So um, just trying to kind of soak it all in, get what I can to uh, you know get me through the next little while until the season actually starts. But uh, all of those things, seeing those on uh, on newsstands or, or bookstores or wherever, you know, makes the season feel a little bit closer. And I think everybody is just uh, anxiously awaiting uh, it to get started and kind of see what uh, what this team's going to look like. I think most of the um, preseason projections I've seen have IU in the top four. The, the Street and Smith's one that I bought today was the only one I think they've been outside of that. So uh, I think generally a pretty pretty positive outlook for a team that we really haven't seen uh, play play very much together. So hopefully they can live up to that billing and. Um, you know, kind of like I said a couple weeks ago, it's nice that other people have a high opinion of the team versus um, us trying to talk ourselves into things from last year. So uh, hopefully that proves to be true. And, uh, you know, just excited to, to talk about some some things this week and uh, I'm looking forward to the season. And to my right, he's a columnist for the big lead and a co-host of The Hangover. But you know him as Indiana Radio's most opinionated, polarizing, over-the-top personality. I pretty much have an opinion on everything. He is Ryan Phillips. Have to say me. I think I'm really good at this. I got to stick with me. I do this for a living. Trust me. I need an adult. Wait, I said that? Ryan, what is your rant this week on IU Basketball? Ryan? Andy, where's Ryan? I, I don't see him. <laughs> see him either. So if you have seen our co-host, uh, let him know that we've started the show, and uh, we'll be happy to bring him on here uh, when he is around. He, probably something came up at work that he had to handle. Um, so anyway, we hope that, uh, that Ryan will be joining us a little bit later for this edition of Assembly Call Radio. But Andy, you and I can handle this. We've done, uh, we've done shows just the two of us before. So I, think, I think we can handle it. I think we can do it. So here's what we're going to talk about this week. Uh, Archie Miller delivered some rare public comments on the College Hoops Today podcast. We will discuss the highlights, uh, and we'll also use that as a jumping off point for diving into our off-season analysis of Duran Davis, because Archie did have some comments about Duran in there. Uh, and then with whatever time we have left, we will answer your questions. A lot of good ones submitted this week, so hopefully we'll have a chance to get to a bunch of those. All of that coming this week on Assembly Call Radio. Before we get to this week's top story, I do want to remind you about the best way to shop online for great deals on IU basketball and football tickets. Just remember this URL, iutickets.shop. It will take you right to SeatGeek, where you can immediately find the best deals on IU tickets, other sports tickets, and concert tickets. And as a bonus, use the promo code ASSEMBLY to get $20 back after your first purchase. And when you use that URL, iutickets.shop, we actually get paid a commission for referring you. And these commissions really add up and have a big impact on helping us cover the cost of running the show, like hosting, upgrading our equipment, and Coach Tonsoni's pipe dreams. I'd like to see a Duke player sometime in my lifetime have a real post move. Once again, the URL is iutickets.shop. Thank you. All right, Andy, you listened to Archie Miller on the College Hoops Today podcast. Um, I had a chance to listen uh, for one of the Banner Morning episodes earlier this week. I, I laid out five highlights from that. Um, so we can talk about some of those, but I want to get your reaction to that first. And, you know, I know a lot of people have talked about this already this week, but it's not very often that we get comments from Archie Miller. Uh, so I feel like it's worth going into again because there was really there was a lot there to react to, I think. Yeah, I thought it was a it was a good interview. I joked with you before we came on that I I 
showed my uh, willingness to do anything for the show by listening to Rothstein. So, um, you know, just want everybody to know that a sacrifice was made and it was, uh, in this case, was worth it. Although, as I told you, I fast forwarded through every part that was not related to the Archie Miller interview, (laughs) except for the lengthy, uh, you know, self-aggrandizing introduction. Yes. So, so what was the biggest thing that stood out? Uh, you know, for me, I think the, the talk about competition and the way that he said, um, about, I forget how he said it, you know, kind of guys are going to have to sacrifice more than they may think they do or, or something to that effect. And I think that speaks to the level of competition for playing time on the roster. And that's one of the things that we have cited in the off season. that we're looking most forward to just to, uh, the competition in practice and those kinds of things. I think, you know, the fact that that's there, that he said that suggests some guys who might walk in the door thinking that they're going to play uh, aren't going to be able to and I think or aren't going to be able to as much as they uh, would anticipate and that to me suggests that a number of guys are really playing well and that that level of competitiveness and practice for uh, earning those minutes on the floor is where a, as fans I think you would want it to be so I think that's a good uh, a good early sign and I think we'll be telling to you know see guys really buy into whatever roles they uh, they shake out into. Boy, and it feels like it's been a while since we've had that kind of depth, doesn't it? <laughs> I mean, yeah, gonna, uh, quite a while. It is. It is going to be a welcome change. You know, the thing that I thought was interesting is, you know, he was asked which of the newcomers has a chance to kind of step in right away, and he very quickly said Evan Fitzner, and that makes sense. I mean, this is a guy who shot, you know, forty percent or better from three point range. He's an upperclassman. He's been in big games, and Archie mentioned all of those things. And I thought after that. It seemed to me, and maybe I'm reading too much into this, but it seemed to me like he went out of his way to not single out any of the other freshmen. Now, they had already talked about Romeo. And and I think what you're seeing is, you know, Indiana's not shying away from not necessarily putting Romeo on a pedestal, but, you know, it's like when Andy Katz talked about 15 freshmen who are primed to really have a big impact this year. The Indiana men's basketball Twitter account retweeted that. So it's not like they're shying away from the fact that you know, Romeo kind of has this reputation and, and, you know, stands apart as one of the best freshmen in the country. But I just thought it was interesting that he really, you know, he talked about, you know, the versatility that Demise and Jerome Hunter bring and the, you know, the maturity and the point guard skills that Robert Finnessy has and what Jake Forrester can do. And I, I just, I thought to me, that was interesting that he didn't want to single any of those guys out, but basically laid out the roles that they can play to earn minutes this year. Um, and you know, I don't know if he was doing that on purpose, but that's kind of how I took it as I was listening to it. Yeah, it's funny. I noticed the same thing and and it's, it's hard because you try to go back and think about just his general demeanor and the way he answers questions and things like that. And you, you kind of think like, guy, he doesn't really, you know, typically doesn't strike you as a guy who's very quick to the point, doesn't really give you a lot of the same cliches or, or I guess even worry about some of the things that you know, that somebody who makes sure they single out every one of those guys, he doesn't seem like he would do that unless um, he really was that impressed with them and, and kind of sees them falling into those roles. It doesn't feel like window dressing where I'm going to say this as a, as a way to, you know, divert attention from any one of them. To me, praise from him is earned. And if he doesn't have anything great to say about you, he's just not going to say anything about you, I think is what I, you know, you know, kind of after listening to him for a year, feels that way. So if you, if you spin it that way, uh, certainly feels like a positive sign that he's, you know, already able to certainly recruit those guys with a vision and then really still sees those guys fitting into roles after having been around them for a little while in the off season. Yeah. All righty. Coming up here on the assembly call, Archie had some other comments about individual players. We're going to hit on those. And he talked about Deron Davis and we'll use that as a jumping off point for our analysis of Deron Davis. That is coming up here on the assembly call next. Stick with us. You are listening to The Assembly Call. Visit assemblycall.com to subscribe for free to our podcast and YouTube channel so you never miss an episode of Assembly Call Radio or our postgame show. And by the way, the YouTube broadcasts include all of the between-segment banter that doesn't make it into the final cut of the radio show or podcast. Uh, and last week, that included this from Ryan. But it's so funny. If you just listen to the radio show, you would have a completely different impression of what the show is like than if you watch the YouTube and That's... the in-between parts. He makes a good point. So one of these days, come check us out on YouTube. I'm Jared Morris. I'm here with Andy Bottoms, talking IU basketball. Uh, and Andy, we've been talking about 
Uh, Archie Miller's appearance on the College Hoops Today podcast with John Rothstein. Uh, we haven't gotten many offseason comments from Archie, so uh, you know, I thought some of these are really interesting. Um, we were talking uh, in between uh, about uh, his comments about Evan Fitzner, and you kind of uh, you made mention that you wanted to hop back into that. What was especially interesting about that to you? Well, I think he he was quick to single out his three point shooting uh, for his career. I believe you know talked about him being a forty percent three point shooter uh, over the course of his career and how many games he'd been a part of and and won. Um, and I think when you mesh that together with some of the comments about Duran and that he's you know not cleared for everything yet, doing uh, doing some things, I think it really reaffirms what a lot of people thought about what Fitzner's role is going to be, particularly early in the season. How well he takes that and runs with it, and how well and how quickly Duran is able to come back probably dictate what his role looks like going forward. But um, it, it, singling him out first. And some of the things he said about him made me feel more confident that he's going to be a guy who who is probably in the starting lineup at the beginning of the season. Yeah, I, I tend to agree with you. A couple of other guys who are likely to be in the starting lineup at the beginning of the season are Justin Smith and Devontae Green. And and I thought Archie had interesting comments on both guys. You know, on Justin Smith, he said that he is, quote, much more explosive and in much better shape uh, than he was last year, has been really been working on his three-point shot. I don't know if you can fathom Justin Smith more explosive in better shape and shooting better from downtown. And maybe that's just, you know, kind of off season hype. But if, if even two of those things are true, <laughs> Justin Smith's breakout is uh is definitely gonna be coming. And then the other one that was really interesting is Devontae Green. And you know, I really think that the comments Archie's made this offseason have been most kind of insightful about Devontae. And they've been the ones that have been the most interesting to me. And he basically said that, you know, he thinks Devontae is kind of past the point of wondering if he should trust this coaching staff. And now, you know, to the point where he really believes in the staff and, and it's led to him becoming a much more mature guy in the locker room and in the rate room and in workouts, which Archie said is quote, a great sign for a guy who has a chance to be more consistent. And I thought that was a really key word there, consistent, because it's not a word Archie has used with Devonte before. And of course it's all conjecture right now, but we know the skills Devonte has. And if that maturity can lead to more consistency, you know, he's the huge X factor for this team, I think. Justin Smith, we all have a pretty good idea. We saw what he can do at the end of last season. We feel fairly certain that he's going to carry that into this year. Devontae is that X factor because the team hasn't really had a difference maker at that position since Yogi left. It can be so important with all the different talent and different options around and with the way that he can defend on top of it when he's really engaged. So... Again, you don't want to be anything more than cautiously optimistic with off-season quotes, but I thought that line about Devontae Green I thought was especially encouraging from a guy in Archie, as you said, who isn't prone to overhyping guys. Well, and I think it's interesting, kind of going back to what I said before, how if you know if he didn't have anything great to say, he probably just wouldn't say anything at all. I think, to your point, they are insightful a little bit. You know, you're getting after the fact maybe some of his concerns, reservations, whatever you want to say about Devonte a year ago, he's kind of letting those out now, now that he feels he's, you know, cleared some of those hurdles and um, is, you know, on a good path there. But I, I thought that was as, as interesting as anything of, yeah, you're saying those things now, which seem to suggest you didn't believe those things in the past. And, um, and so, you know, if, if you lay out the question marks for this team, I think, uh, you know, what the, the point guard position would be number one by a pretty wide margin. So, uh, I think that's an area we're all kind of grasping for something to to make us feel a little more comfortable, a little bit better. Uh, and certainly anything about Devontae in the offseason seems to suggest he's really turned a corner. And we've talked about that a little bit as well of, you know, he was a guy who was like, you know, if he's really button heads with Archie or they're not seeing eye to eye, um, is he a guy who would who would leave? And he certainly hasn't done that. And I think that's uh, a positive sign. It seems to just, you know, kind of want to work through and improve. And, and hopefully that proves to be the case once the... Uh, once the ball's rolled out. Yeah, it sounds like, you know, Archie maybe had the sense that he was, you know, again, teetering a little bit on how much he was buying into to the coaches and everything. And, and look, you know, Archie didn't recruit him here. It takes time to build those relationships. And perhaps now that there's been a little bit more time and he's seen the vision that the staff has for him, he's more fully bought in. He's an upperclassman. You know, a lot of things are adding up. To, to make you feel better about believing in a more consistent Devante this season. So again, you don't want to be anything more than cautiously optimistic about it, but, but there are definitely good signs there before we get to his comments about Duran, which will then lead us into talking about Duran. Anything else from the, from the interview that you want to respond to or react to? 
no not not really i mean i think his answer about like you know chemistry and togetherness you highlighted that on the on banner morning the other the other day uh i think that's certainly when, when you have a team with this many new faces who haven't played together always going to be a question mark and that's one of the things that you know, if you, if you looked outside of that point guard question before, I think that's another one. You've got a lot of new guys here, and everybody's really excited about what those guys can be this year and will be in the future. Um, but I certainly, as you look at that, it, it, if the guys seem to be getting along as well as they have in some of the offseason, you know, content that the that the basketball Twitter account and things like that have put out, I think that's a positive sign. Um particularly in a scenario when with some of those, you know, people are going to have to make sacrifices. If you're not together as a team and don't have good chemistry, those are the things that are really going to cause problems that can, you know, fester and, and give you issues later. So, uh, you know, it seems like all that's, all, you put all that together, it feels like he's got a pretty good pulse uh, on where the team is right now and, uh, and gives fans something to look for as, as the season gets started. You're listening to Assembly Call Radio. I'm Jared Morris here with Andy Bottoms. Andy, let's talk about Duran Davis. Uh, you know, Archie spent a decent amount of time talking about Duran, giving a, a detailed update. Basically, said he's not yet cleared for contact. He has been participating in about sixty to seventy percent of the activities uh, that IU's been doing in their workouts, but they definitely want to take it slow with him. Uh, but he is on path to be ready to start practicing on October first. So we'll have to see if that actually happens. You know, obviously a big question mark for Duran is going to be what is his conditioning? And Archie talked about this, that, you know, a guy Duran size with that injury, you know, he's going to have to get back into shape and, and, and he's going to have to get, you know, into game shape. Um, and so it still feels like a big wait and see for when he'll actually be able to play in a game and what we can expect from him. So let me use that as, as, as kind of the first question to you. What do you think is fair to expect from Duran coming off this Achilles injury? And does do Archie's comments change at all your timetable for when he might be ready? Uh, you know, I, I think we've we've touched on this a number of times. I feel like throughout the off season, it's such an injury that really takes away explosiveness from from guys, and and how that has really become something that is while they've made advancements in the treatment of that, you look at how quick some guys can come back from knee injuries and still, and, and come back to relatively soon be what they were athletically. Um, the Achilles isn't one that, that typically falls in that category. And so I think that gives you extra concern for a guy who uh, w was not explosive athletically to begin with. Um, and, you know, some of the weight issues that were out there. So I think I've always been pretty cautious about what you can really expect from him. And I almost feel like, anything that you get out of him this year is a bonus at this point. And if you set your expectation that, you know what, he may be back sooner than we think, then that would be, you know, icing on the cake. But I think it's reasonable to, to say, you know, you may not get very much out of him this year. And I don't say that as an indictment on Duran or anything like that. I think it's just a difficult injury to come back for, for somebody who is his size, his, you know, athletic makeup and plays the position that he does the way that he plays it. In our next segment, I want to get into some numbers and talk about some of Duran's improvement last year. Because I, I mean, I knew that he had played better last year, but actually, when I looked at the numbers again, I was kind of surprised by how much better he got in a lot of areas. But let me ask you this to close out this segment. As you start to think about lineups that can work with Duran, given what he's good at offensively, you know, obviously being, being a guy down in the post that can really score efficiently down there. But what his limitations are defensively, which is he defends the post very well, but really struggles to kind of get out, move around in space, get to shooters, that kind of thing. Given the other personnel now around him, what lineups do you think will work with him out there? It's it's funny because um, the three-man weave, uh, we, we cited their player rankings not very long ago. In their preview of IU, they did some kind of on-off-the-court numbers when Duran and Juwan played together. And they weren't very good, quite honestly, on either end of the floor when they played together. So it's almost like you've got this, you know, kind of bevy of wing players at this point. You put him out there with four guys who can just kind of switch anything and are, you know, a Jerome Hunter, uh, Al Durham, Romeo, Devante, and, and, you know, pick pick another, you know, wing player. Guys who can be really versatile and kind of make up for some of his deficiencies on the, now, on the defensive end of the floor. Now, do you think part of that is because, I mean, Juwan really operated a lot in the post last year, and that's, I mean, essentially where Duran goes offensively. So it kind of clogs up the, the lane for Juwan a little bit. I think offensively that could explain it. I don't know defensively if it does. Um, 
but I'm not sure what Duran's numbers were defensively just in general. So I think that's a question mark. I think what you said is definitely was a factor on offense. And and as Juwan, you know, maybe plays a little bit differently this year, I think that's fair. And as the shooting on the team hopefully is better, you know, Duran's a guy who's going to be a back to the basket player. And can you surround him with enough shooters to really keep defenses honest and give him a little room to operate inside as well? You know, it's funny. You you, you think about what he and Fitzner could be capable of together offensively, and it's pretty interesting. But then you try to think about those guys playing defense. And it's somewhat of a nightmare. <laughs> and, then you, and then you start screaming. And then you... Yeah. 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 I mean, I mean, is there any possible way that you could get those two guys on the court together? I, I don't think the way that Archie wants to play defense, in theory, you could, if you played a zone, maybe you could try to, you know, hide, hide Fitzner in one of the spots there. But I, I certainly don't see Archie uh, going that route. So uh, with that as backdrop, I would be hard pressed to see that one. But I guess you never say never. <laughs> Never say never. Uh, Okay, I just saw something very interesting pop up over here uh, in the Zoom window. We're going to reveal what that is. And also coming up, those of you listening on the radio Friday night may be switching over to high school football. For everyone else, we're going to continue our discussion on Deron Davis. That is next on the Assembly Call. Stick with us, and maybe Ryan will be back. Welcome back to the Assembly Call. You are with us right now, indulging in some in-depth IU basketball talk here in the middle of September, still weeks away from practice beginning. Clearly, you are more than just a casual IU fan, which is why you need to be subscribed to our free IU basketball email newsletter. You will get our Six Banner Sunday news roundups, as well as our detailed post-game analysis emails once the season begins. There's a high-level operation going on out there. This content is in-depth and written with the IU diehard in mind, someone like you. And there's a chance that you already are on the list, since there are more than 6,000 of your fellow IU fans already on there. But joining is easy. Just text IU to 66866 or go to assemblycall.com. Again, go to assemblycall.com or text IU to 66866 and join our free IU Hoops email newsletter today. Make no excuses. Okay. Whoa. Can we get some basketball, please? Yes, let's get some basketball. Okay. Uh, I'm Jared Morris. I'm here with Andy Bottoms and Ryan Phillips. Whoa, Ryan Phillips, you joined us. Yeah, just snuck on in. Yeah. <laughs> it's great to have you here. Yeah. Uh, I'm happy to be here. Do you want to offer any explanation to the podcast audience for uh, why you weren't there after your just great introduction from segment one? Nope. <laughs> okay, that works. Uh, so let's continue talking about Deron Davis. We started talking about him in the last segment. And, you know, I think as, as we were talking about between segments, it's really easy to look at what happened last year. And he gets hurt. Indiana gets better as the season goes along. And obviously there were some moments of kind of defensive lapses that stood out you know, for Duran, and you kind of think, okay, Indiana was better without him. Maybe Duran's not that good. And we're going to talk about some deficiencies that he still has. But I think what's gotten lost there is how much he improved last year. And that was especially true on the offensive end. I mean, he is a really, really efficient offensive player. In fact, 92nd in the country in terms of points per possession on possessions used. Uh, and he was really, really good on post-ups. He cut his turnover percentage in half. Uh, he increased his minutes per game because obviously he worked on his conditioning and ability to play more. Um, and, and so, you know, and even defensively, you know, good at defending post-ups, struggled in some other areas, but made up for some of his defensive deficiencies with more activity, more awareness. He had more blocks. He increased his defensive rebounding. He had more steals. So, you know, and I've gotten caught up in it a little bit too. And so in hindsight, you know, thinking back to how he played, especially in games like against Duke, and you look at the overall numbers, he was a much better player last year than he was as a freshman which, if he can come back from this Achilles injury, I think does you know kind of portend well for what he can do as a junior if he's healthy, if he's in shape, and if Archie can figure out the rotations to where it makes sense and you put guys around him that minimize his defensive issues. As you look, Ryan, at what Duran can provide this year, let's just assume that he gets healthy, okay? And we're all kind of more conservative and maybe more pessimistic on when he'll be able to play. But I think most just... of us feel like it'll be second half of the season. Yes. Essentially, yeah. We do. But when he comes back, what do you think he can provide for this team on the positive side? And how do you see it, if it works with him in there, how do you kind of see that working in terms of lineups and rotations and stuff? 
I mean, as you said, he was a really efficient offensive player when he was out there for the most part, when he got touches. Uh, there, were, there were times where he inexplicably didn't get touches. Maybe that's on Duran. Maybe that's on the guys feeding the post. Maybe that's just on guys at the time not being used to the offense. And you, you mentioned how the, the team got better without him. They got better because they got more comfortable in Archie's system. That, that had nothing to do with not having a post player and not having Duran there. Uh, maybe as he's kind of a slower guy, maybe he slows things down from a transition perspective a little, but he, that's, you know, he's a good enough offensive player and a good enough all around player that having him makes you better. It just does. And, and we saw him against Duke run circles around two lottery picks, um, I, I, you know, in, in Wendell Carter and uh, Marvin Bagley when he was in the low post and when they fed him, he just dominated that game when you for stretches, when he was in it, uh, he missed time because of fouls. Had he been there the whole game? Maybe I, you wins it. Uh, but I, I think that he's a guy who will give you offense in the post. He'll rebound. Uh, the defensive side of things is going to be interesting to see how they mask him. Because if you have to put Deron Davis out on the perimeter, guarding somebody in a pick and roll situation, as we discussed during the break, that's not a great situation. And that's not going to be playing to his strength. And so you've got to, what that means is you've got to, you know, use help and use, you know, rotations and everything to kind of mask that, as you said. And so I think that's going to be a problem no matter what, especially for a guy coming off an Achilles. He's not going to be fleet of foot, you know, with his lateral quickness. So I think they're on the, the things that if there was no injury, the things that he really had to work on free throw shooting, uh, finishing at the rim, which he, he got much better at last year, but as a post guy in the big 10, you got to do that. And, and I think that defending post up situations, he was fine, but with so many more versatile players now, he's going to have to play out on the perimeter a little bit. And, and I think that, that was the biggest thing is maybe working on his quickness and stuff. But I mean, I look, you're going to be better if Ron Davis is on your team. So I, I, we're all hoping he's back and he's healthy and ready to play. Boy, the free throw shooting was just, that was such a strange drop last year. He shot 75.6% as a freshman from the line. Yeah. A decent amount of attempts and was 50% last year. I, I, I wonder if it had something to do with his, with the transformation of his body and maybe he was a lot stronger than he used to be and you know maybe lost some of the touch on those free throws it does happen to guys they get used to it they move into it and 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 the feel for it comes back but i wouldn't be surprised if he had gotten a lot stronger and that changed his motion a little bit uh you know just a hair and you know you change a free throw motion a little bit you can really mess it up if you're listening to Assembly Call Radio, I'm Jared Morris here with Ryan Phillips and Andy Bottoms. You know, Ryan, you brought up something interesting there when it comes to looking at numbers. And we all like to analyze numbers, you know, but the context is so important. Sometimes there's stuff hidden in there that the numbers don't show. You know, like you said, Duran was very efficient when he got the ball last year, but that's one thing that didn't change. His usage percentage was the same from his freshman year to his sophomore year. It was about 22%. And if he's going to be on the floor, he probably needs to use more possessions, get more shots up, because we know he's giving up stuff on the other end. And he's so efficient offensively, he's got to get the ball. And so whatever the explanation is for that, you know, him getting in position more, being stronger, being more consistently engaged, that's going to have to improve. And Andy, something else that we were talking about, you know, you look at some of the defensive metrics and, you know, defending post-ups, he's very good. You know, defending shooters. Not very good, which makes sense because he struggles to kind of you know move out there and 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 get to shooters. The thing that that doesn't really show in any of those numbers, even numbers as detailed as synergies, is pick and roll, and that's an area where he really struggled last year. And you know you can see that based on the eye test, but it doesn't necessarily show up in the numbers. And that's an area where he'll really have to improve if he's going to play extended minutes. Yeah, as we as we mentioned real quick, I just wanted to jump in and say that look, I'm full of energy, making up uh, for lost time <laughs> for some reason. Uh, is that a lot of those defensive metrics are subjective, and, and you know because it's about the people charting them and picking them, so they're not going to cover every single scenario. I think that's why you see that. I think we all noticed in pick and roll last year that Teron Davis was not the greatest defender and and struggled with that. So I mean, d- despite the numbers not being there, uh, I think that was pretty obvious. It, yeah, I think uh, d- just to go back to the offense piece real quick, uh, I, you know, the team last year, based on their struggle of shooting the ball, was was kind of ill-equipped to complement him uh, offensively. And so defenses are just sagging in uh, on him. And so while he can be really, you know, his, his best place uh, to get the ball, you know, in the post, like they're just daring people to make shots. And so I think it becomes harder for him to use more possessions. I, 
ideally, uh, a lot of the guys that that I use counting on this year to improve that situation are guys we haven't seen play uh, either at the college level at all or for IU. So it's a little bit tough to say whether that situation will improve itself. But but to the extent that uh, you know he gets back, you've got some guys who who have some experience by the second half of the year and maybe can uh, complement what he brings a little bit better and give him a little bit more room to operate. And then on the defensive end, I think it's it's hard because Archie is a guy who. You know, and you saw this as the year went on. There were clear ways that they wanted to play ball screens. And I, you know, early in the season, anybody who would who would play against Duran would just drag him out and and you know force him um, to to do that. And he just couldn't shut things off. And and they got guys turning the corner on him. Then your defense gets in rotation, and it's all downhill from there. I think that happened a lot in the Michigan game. I feel like, um, it, you know, against teams that are playing a little bit smaller like Michigan or have versatile big guys who can step out like Michigan did. And that puts him in those situations where the numbers do kind of tell the story from a, you know, defending jump shooters. Can he really close out uh, on, you know, on the kinds of big men that are playing a lot in college basketball and in basketball in general now that can really step out and stretch the floor. So that's going to continue to be a challenge. That would have been a challenge for him if he didn't get hurt. Um, And so I think it just becomes more of a challenge as you try to figure out how he can regain the explosiveness that he had uh, and, and kind of, you know, in some ways he almost just has to get smarter about how to do that. You've got to, you know, outsmart people on how you play. He might not be more explosive athletically. He probably won't be. Um, so how do you, you know, take the right angles and those kinds of things as you just get, you know, a little bit smarter about how you play some of those scenarios as well to try to make up for some of the physical limitations that are, are going to be there. Let me play devil's advocate for a second, Ryan. Uh, you know, I think most of us agree that, this roster is better with Duran. He's a good player. This team can be better with Duran. I think that would be especially true if you had a healthy Duran from day one. But do you think that, you know, if he can't start playing in games until midway through the season, because the style just kind of has to change when he's on the floor because of some of his limitations and because his strengths are so unique from the other guys, could that cause an issue trying to work him in in the middle of the year? If you've played your non-conference schedule, you've gotten used to playing one way, and now for 12 to 15 minutes a game, you're really having to do things differently because this guy has such a unique set of skills that you're trying to work in. Just because of that particular circumstance, could it make it harder for this team to reach its ceiling with him? No, I don't think so. I, I think that I think that the uh, the coaching staff will be planning for that all year. Uh, you know, it's not like, it's not like he'll show up and they'll be like, Oh gosh, how are we going to do this? I, you know, there's gotta be a plan for how to, for how to work him in. And, you know, as you said, if he's only playing like 15 minutes a game or something like that, maybe you do have to adjust some things or figure out the lineups that work best with him. And yeah, it's a feeling out process, but remember it, as long as his team is winning to some degree and, and in the mix in the big 10, their goal is to be the best they can possibly be in March. And, you're better with the Ron Davis on this field. And if that takes a couple games of trying to figure it out and, and and trying to, uh, you know, fit things together and maybe you don't play your best for a game or two or three, but you wind up being better on the court at the end of the season. And that's absolutely worth it. Heading into the big 10 tournament, heading into March. And it's, it's interesting. You kind of think of it, you know, people talk about this, IU football last year where, you you know, you had, two very different players playing quarterback and the team at times would struggle in the transition from one to the other to try to kind of like what you said, Jared, you know, you, you might not be able to play the same way when, you know, Richard Lego is on the field as you do when Peyton Ramsey's there. It's, it's kind of one of those scenarios. So, um, but it's not as if even when he's not on the floor, you wouldn't dump the ball into the post. Maybe that guy's Juwan Morgan when he's not on the floor. So I don't think it's totally different, but it does remind me a little bit of those kinds of scenarios where you've you've got a team that can kind of play different ways, and that is a challenge. I mean, that proved to be a challenge for IU from a football perspective last year. Um, so I, it's an interesting thing to think about, and it's going to be hard to tell because you're not really he's not going to be back soon enough or back at full strength to really get a gauge on how they intend to use him uh, early in the season, and so it may be a while before we have insight into what that really means. Yeah, and I just want to, I just want to stress that the coaches know that and they're, you know, preparing for it and they're they you know, they know that they're going to have to work him in. They know that they're going to have to set things up a little differently because he is different than the other post players they have and that he isn't going to swing out on the perimeter and be effective out there. So, uh, you know, they'll have certain things set up and I'm sure they'll they'll put it put him in with certain lineups that that make him a better player. Are you trying to suggest that Archie Miller is prepared and has a plan? 
I might be, yeah. I think you might be right. Uh, Kent in our live chat brings up a good point. He says, maybe it's a positive for IU as the opponent won't have film with Deron Davis on the court and will have to adapt to a different look from IU. It's one way to look at it. It's, it's a good way to look at it. Any final thoughts on Deron before we hop into our final segment and do some questions? I hope he gets healthy. Um, I I ho- and I hope he's fully healthy when they when they bring him back. That's a devastating injury. It takes a long time to come back from. You know, it's there are some injuries where even when you're back, you're not fully back. And I, and I feel like the Achilles is definitely one of them. And uh, I think uh, you know, I think we all just want him to be healthy. And and, and fans and, should be patient because even when yeah. he does come back, there's a difference between being in game shape and practice shape and kind of being in rhythm. You know, because he's Absolutely. he is a obviously he plays down on the block. And he added some more power, but he's not necessarily a power post player. Like he's footwork and skill, not necessarily finesse, but I mean, some of that stuff yeah. is going to take him a little while to kind of get going. He's not just overpowering people um, down there. So, you know, he may get back and then it may still take him another month to kind of get back to being the guy that we remember. Um, all righty. Coming up in our final segment, we are going to answer your questions. We got one, Andy, about our favorite Brian Evans moment in lieu of his Hall of Fame induction, so we'll let Ryan answer that one. Uh, That's coming up on the Assembly Call. Stick with us. Listening to the Assembly Call, we are wrapping up another week of talking IU basketball. I'm Jared Morris here with Andy Bottoms and Ryan Phillips. And for our final segment, we are going to turn to your questions. We've got a lot of good ones submitted, and so we will hop right into those. Uh, we had a question submitted to our Assembly Call question hotline. Uh, this comes to us from Bob Thompson. Uh, so I will play his question now, right here. I keep thinking about Race Thompson and just feel like he's kind of overlooked, maybe undervalued, even though we don't know what his value will be. So what do you guys think the ceiling is for Race Thompson this coming year? Thanks again, guys. Uh, love the show. Andy, your thoughts on the ceiling for Race Thompson? And also, just to kind of connect this to what we were just talking about, how might having a guy like Race actually help Indiana's coaching staff be able to be a little bit more patient with Deron Davis? Yeah, I mean, I think he's another unknown that gets lost in the shuffle a little bit with all the, you know, the true freshmen that are coming in and and Fitzner as well. So I definitely think he'll play a role um, as a guy who has a leg up on 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 those true freshmen in terms of learning the system and and being around the program, the weight room, and all those kinds of things. And I think as as we were talking about in the break, the you know the luxury that IU has, given the depth that we've you know harped on uh, a lot so far is that they don't have to rush to run back. Again, I don't think for a minute that they would um, you know, do anything that's not in his best interest, but, but you can look at it and, and at least say, hey, there's a lot of guys who can step in and try to you know, kind of cobble together uh, minutes a, as you go through. And so I think that's a luxury that this team has because of that depth. And um, so they can you know, let him, allow him to make the best decision for his uh, you know, basketball career without feeling like, you know, he's got to get back out there because the team is in desperate need of him. He certainly makes the team better, as we've talked about before, but I don't think it's a, a you know, dire situation if he's somehow not able to, uh, you know, to get back this year, even at all. And Ryan, you've been pretty high on race. And, and you know, he is a guy who was a top 100 recruit, you know, redshirted. So he's been in the system for a year, improved his body. I mean, I think at this point, we would all be pretty surprised if he doesn't carve out a role in the rotation at some point this season. Oh, for sure. I mean, he's a guy who's just out of sight, out of mind for fans because he's been sitting on the bench and you've seen him in a warm up jersey, not, you know, an actual jersey. And uh, look, when we were in Bloomington last year, we saw a race on the court doing some workout stuff. And I turned to Jared and I'm like, he's way bigger than he was like, you know, he that that's a guy who worked on his body and got in a really good shape. And that's the whole point of him enrolling early in redshirting was to get better. Uh, so I would say I. I I mean, I I know you love player comparisons, Jared. I've always said that he reminds me a little of of uh, Juwan Morgan, sort of a post guy, but a lot more versatile. And I would like, you know, he's maybe won't be able to do some of the things that Juwan could do, like bringing the ball up or, I guess, guarding on the perimeter regularly. But I think that that's kind of freshman year. Juwan Morgan is kind of where I would where I would think that maybe his contributions would come. Certainly, a big guy, long arms, can do a lot on the offensive end, and uh, I think he he'll he'll be a great help on the defensive end too. 
That I really thought that was a useful comment by you, especially since it included a player comp. That, yeah, I know you do love the player comps. <laughs> Unsolicited from you, I like <sighs> I, that. Shows a lot of humility. You want to bring the best to the audience, even though you don't personally believe in them. Well, so, you know, I'm well rested. I figured I should fire one out. <laughs> that drop is going to come back to haunt you. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, if I got... worried about that at this point, I get nothing done. So I'm just uh, worried about the drops. I just That's, you know. it'll cool off a little bit when the season gets here. Anyway. Uh, okay. Here's a question from our buddy IU Artifacts. Uh, do you all have a favorite Brian Evans moment in lieu of his IU Hall of Fame induction? Uh, Andy? I'm shocked it took this long. By the way, how did this yeah, take I, this long to get Brian Evans in the Hall of Fame? Yeah, you know what's funny is I was I was typing up the banner morning because it was his birthday, and I was doing it before I heard about the the Hall of Fame announcement, and I was about to just say Indiana Athletics Hall of Famer Brian Evans because I just assumed that he was, which is just yet another example of how underrated his career was because he was phenomenal. Yeah, I mean, to me, um, you know, a couple of stand out. I mean, this is not a specific moment because it happened multiple times, but you know, him in the middle of a game, like popping his shoulder back into place, yeah. uh, and then just kind of continuing on like nothing had happened. Um, but I think where he first kind of, I, I don't know, I'll say burst onto the scene was in that um, the the game at Michigan in 1993. Like he came off the bench and hit a couple big threes uh, when IU beat the Fab Five in Michigan. I think when they were ranked second, I don't remember where IU was, but he had a couple really big shots. Uh, in that game and at that point he was a guy that I don't think you know certainly people knew about from a recruiting perspective and uh, but um, hadn't done as much in in games and really came in and gave some good minutes and then eventually was a guy who was uh, I think he won Big Ten Player of the Year did he not at at 1996 over the course of it yeah by the time he was a senior really saw his role grow and uh, and do things like that. So that was kind of like my initial memory of him is is him making a couple of big shots in that game. Yeah, I mean, he's a guy who went from five points to 11 to 17 to 21 through his career. And, you know, just every step of the way, kind of stepping up and roll and seizing it as a senior, 21 points, seven boards, four assists. I mean, just a great statistical season was, I mean, the sun, the stars and the moon for that team. I mean, everything revolved around him uh, and really came through. You know, the other moment that really stands out i mean there were so many big shots that he hit you know you just you know think about all those threes that he made from the corner that sweet lefty shot that he had but he hit the game winner against penn state in 1993 which was you know one of the you know a game that was really in doubt for that indiana team they took him to double overtime evans ends up hitting the shot and he has this great quote after the game he says i just hit this big shot and i thought i would go in the locker room be mobbed by my teammates but coach was livid thought we played like crap he went to the press conference and said he was rooting for penn state because they deserve to win <laughs> which is vintage wow. vintage vintage coach night there um, i just i remember staying up late to uh to watch that game as a kid uh, and just you know, living and dying with it. Greg Graham fouled out before overtime, and you know, as Evan said, he airballed a shot early in the game and didn't think he was going to get back in. But enough guys fouled out that he got in and made that <laughs> big shot. So, he, you know, he was just he was part of some great teams. You know, played with Alan Henderson and Damon Bailey. Uh, you know, the year after uh, that '93 team, uh, and just. Just was a really good player. One of the more underrated ones in IU history, I think. Um, Ryan, obviously, you didn't grow up, you know, idolizing Brian Evans like some of us on the show. Um, what were your What are your thoughts on him? He was always to me, you know, and, and I've said this before that I kind of uh, admired IU basketball from afar, being in Southern California and uh, being an unathletic white kid. Uh, well, sorry, I would say mildly athletic. Uh, but he was that guy who was six eight, had the you know, had the indie what I looked like an Indiana haircut and and just he just seemed like the quintessential Indiana player. I'd say guys like him and like Kirk Haston and you know they're Damon Bailey, of course. He was looked, like Ricky Rowe in real life. Yeah. No, ships. I mean they looked <laughs> like when you think Indiana basketball, that's what it looks like. And you know, very sadly, very white. But this is like in the nineties. Like, you know, and and having that that sort of Indiana buzz cut and you know, being able to do everything on the floor, being able to shoot and also being big enough to go into the post and make some moves, not like being out on the perimeter and be able to like juke you out of your shoes, but like solidly know how to get to the hoop and be savvy and all that. I mean, there were just guys who were that quintessential IU guy. And I thought, I think that there was like a line of them and it was Damon Bailey and then it was Brian Evans and then it was whoever. And then it was like Kirk Haston. And then it was just, you know, it just kind of like went down the line with these guys. And, and there was always one where you're like, Oh yeah, that guy plays for Indiana. 
And uh, he was the guy for me, I, you know, that you looked at and you were like, oh, yeah, that, that's like the perfect Indiana player. Which, it, which is also, also kind of ridiculous because it totally overlooks Alan Henderson and Calvert Chaney and Jay of course, Edwards. And like I, all I these agree. guys it's who com- aren't that quote unquote stereotype. Yeah, it's it's completely ridiculous. But that's what the stereotype was. And a lot of it has to do with movies like Hoosiers and, you know, you just blue chips where they throw Bobby Hurley on the team. Like what's going on there? Like, but, but it's, you know, it is, it's, it's, it, you're right. It's completely unfair because some of the greatest players in IU history looked nothing like that, but that's sort of, you know, from the forties on, that's sort of what Indiana basketball like image was. And, uh, he was one of those guys. So I, yeah, he was certainly a guy I admired and loved to watch play, uh, on weekends when they broadcast him here. Uh, okay, we have this question from our buddy Alex. Uh, says in his interview with Rothstein, Archie noted chemistry and unity being a key concern for the upcoming year. Uh, by either expounding on that issue or addressing another, what do you believe will be Archie's greatest challenge in his second year with the team? Uh, Ryan, what do you think? Greatest? Challenge? I think it's. Go ahead. No, no, yeah, go. I I, I think it's going to be fitting all these puzzle pieces together because there's a lot of talent on this team and there's a lot of guys who are you know freshmen who are new and you know maybe they're not going to be playing as much. And how do you balance that uh, with the guys coming back who are going to play a lot and, and, uh, you know, just fitting this in because it's the first time he's had this much talent ever on a team at, at Dayton at IU. But the thing is, is that he's been a, he's been an assistant at places where they've had these issues. And I, I think that he will have learned how to how to do that. And I also feel like Archie's the kind of guy who's up front with people and will tell them straight up, this is what we're looking for for you. Your role is going to grow as it moves along. But right now, it's not you're not there yet. Uh, so we'll see how he handles that. It'll be a new challenge for him. Uh, but I think that that's going to be a huge thing for him is figuring out how to please everybody with minutes and and also put the best product on the floor. All right, we've got a couple minutes left. Let's hit this question from Jared, and it kind of dovetails with uh, what I talked about in the banner moment. But other than making fans feel good by locking down Hoosier basketball players, what benefits are there to building a roster with this inside-out strategy, focusing on Indiana, you know, also the breadbasket of Illinois, Ohio? And Andy, you hit that first, and then Ryan. Like, what is what is the benefit other than you're just more likely to get better players because of the proximity? I like that you put this question in here like it was yours, but then you spelled your name differently in the document. So it seems like it's not you. So you're asking for a friend. We get it. Okay. Uh, I mean, from my perspective, I mean, I do think one of the things that, that people have a great deal of pride in, in the team and in players coming from that. And I do think it, as much as I c- can kind of say, you know what, if this team's winning, I don't think people care if players are from Australia or South Dakota, it doesn't really matter. I do think there's a certain level of pride for people and ideally for players coming from the state, wearing the jersey, playing for the team and having success. And so I think from a fan base perspective, it becomes really important. I'm not sure that, you know, I don't know what it really does for on court performance. You know, I certainly, you know, we certainly have a high opinion of, of, you know, the basketball programs in the state and things like that. But I think one of the big ones is just kind of fan pride. And that means something, even though it's kind of intangible and, and may not really may or may not actually make a difference to what they're doing on the court. Well, and Indiana's better teams have been built on guys from those states and especially from in-state. Ryan, you want to hit that real quick? Like, what, Why does yeah. it matter? Yeah, I think that part of it is creating pipelines in the state. You create mm-hmm. connections with high school programs, and then you know if you get a guy from, let's say, New Albany, and then a Romeo comes along, you've got a relationship there. You've got evidence that this guy played well, and it's easier to create those pipelines in-state than it is out-of-state. And you create pride in the team in state. If these guys know the guys playing for the team, if they have friends who play for the team, you really create a pride around IU being Indiana's team by just, you know, funneling all that. And there's, there's so much talent in Indiana that there's no, there's no need to go that far afield to get that team. Obviously, if there's a great player out there, you can go poach him. But, but I think the focus is staying in Indiana, locking down the state is yeah. a great one. It's a really good point about the pipelines too. That's one we hadn't talked about. You are when you're rested, man. You really bring it on fire. Yeah. <laughs> All righty. Well, that will do it for us on this week's episode of the Assembly Call. If you want to see us do the show live and be part of the live chat, join us at assemblycall.com on Thursday nights for the live broadcast of our Assembly Call radio recording. Or you can always subscribe to our podcast by searching for Assembly Call wherever you listen to podcasts. And don't forget to go to assemblycall.com slash join to join our free email newsletter. 
Thank you for listening. We will be back to talk IU hoops again with you next week. Until then, keep your elbows in and your eyes on the rim. And go Hoosiers. Thank everybody for coming out. All right. I got to get out of here, folks. Thank you. Thank you for being here and for listening to this episode of The Assembly Call. We appreciate it. And we really do rely on the support of audience members like you to keep our show going and to keep growing. And so we have set up a page on our website at assemblycall.com slash support that lists five ways that you can support The Assembly Call. And we encourage you to choose whichever method is the easiest and most convenient for you. One of the methods is donating, and so many of you have donated, and we appreciate it so much. On that page, you can choose a monthly recurring donation or an annual recurring donation or just a one-time donation, whatever works for you. And if you don't want to donate, another way to support the show is you can use our affiliate URLs, iutickets.shop or iustore.shop when you're going to shop for tickets or gear, and we will get paid a small commission when you use those links. But however you support the show, We appreciate it. Thank you.